Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to, um, to uh, welcome you to today's roundtable, to today's Innovation X roundtable. And uh, I'm Iklak Sidhu. I'm the Chief Scientist and Faculty Director for the Sitarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. Our mission at the Sitarja Center is to empower innovators to positively change the world. We do this through a few different ways. One of them is by educating students using a Berkeley method of entrepreneurship, which is helping them develop both the mindset and behaviors for entrepreneurship, as well as the professional skills. Uh, we also do it through our professional programs, uh, including um, that cover areas like leadership, innovation, technology skills. For example, Engineering Leadership Professional Program, ELPP, this is a program that's run over 10 years. Uh, we have had students or participants from just about every leading technology firm, uh, um, from Google, Yahoo, Network Appliances, Samsung, Cisco, um, just the host of um, innovative companies uh, in Silicon Valley around the world. Uh, we also host innovation labs, and we use a innovation engineering framework to do that. Uh, we're doing uh, labs and projects in areas of data, blockchain, which is particularly relevant on today's uh, session, uh, deplastifying the planet, uh, alternative meats, uh, and other labs. Um, and we engage external stakeholders, uh, that is uh, companies, universities, uh, um, and ways that we can connect uh, with, let them connect with Berkeley and let them connect with each other. Uh, one, um, one thing that we like to do with these roundtables is uh, discuss what's been changing in the world. Definitely, there's been a lot of change in this last year, but change really does create opportunity. And uh, we're looking at all of these changes to understand what's next in a lot of different ways. Um, one thing that we tend to want to have from, the, from these roundtables is a little bit like a mini advisory board meeting. So as the panelists are discussing how the world is changing and what it means for digital assets and cryptocurrency, at some point we would love to get that translated back into what we should be doing in the center, what we should be doing at Berkeley and what our students can be doing, how uh, our ecosystem can participate and what we should do to be part of the changes that are going on, how we can support that. So uh, today um, we're uh, um, kind of ready to talk about digital assets and cryptocurrency. And I'm going to hand it off to Jocelyn Weber to um, pick up the next sequence or, or set of words, I guess. Yeah, thanks so much, Iklak. And um, I'm Jocelyn Weber Phipps and I lead our blockchain efforts for the Sudarcha Center. And you know, thank you to this panel and our listeners joining us today. I think we're at a unique inflection point um, at this point in time for digital assets and cryptocurrencies in terms of adoption. And hopefully our work with the leaders like these panelists um, can help us move this space forward in a credible and regulated manner that allows for the most beneficial innovation to take place. So to set the context today, I wanted to briefly share four things that are underway on the Berkeley campus um, to help you understand kind of our work. Um, first, you know, about our faculty and students. We're very fortunate to have some very notable faculty on our campus, um, including Shafi Goldwasser, who's the co-inventor of Zero Knowledge Proofs, which is a key cryptography innovation that's being used in a lot of blockchain projects today. And Don Song, who's launched Oasis Labs, and Alessandro Pisha, where his work with Zcash. In addition, we have an amazing student group, um, Blockchain at Berkeley, um, that's been in existence since 2016 and is doing consulting and education and research. And these students are leaving Berkeley and going into the top projects and uh, companies in the space. 
And one of our alumni from this group um, announced this week that he's raised $28 million for his startup, Alio, that's building on the work by um, Shafi Goldwasser using zero knowledge proofs. And uh, that funding was led by Andreessen Horowitz. So we're very excited to share that news um, for Howard Wu and his startup, Alio. Um, secondly, we're creating a talent pipeline for this industry beyond just the Blockchain at Berkeley student group. There's four academic courses going on this semester that's related to this technology. There's a decentralized finance course um, being taught by Don Song and Christine Parler. And this is for PhDs in computer science and finance. Um, we also have a semester long hackathon type course called Building with Blockchain for Web 3.0. And this is on second and third generation blockchain protocols. And we also have a developers and fundamentals course in blockchain being taught by the student group blockchain at Berkeley. Thirdly, we have an accelerator that we've been running since January of 2019 that as Rich Lyons likes to say, invites the outside world in to what we're doing in blockchain here at Berkeley. And this keeps our learning very applied and creates tremendous opportunity for our students and the entrepreneurs who join us. Um, 65 teams and counting have been part of this accelerator. Um, last but not least, um, we hope to open up the campus this fall or next spring to visiting researchers from around the world and also executives who would like to come in residence and collaborate with us in this technology area. So lots of activity underway at UC Berkeley that's really exciting in this space. And, um, you know, but much more work to be done. And so we look forward to the inputs from the panelists today to help us learn how we can um, be more helpful from Berkeley. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich Lyons and let him lead this panel discussion and I'll see you all closer to the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jocelyn. Thanks, Ziklock. Thanks to everybody uh, at SCET, the Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And look, it, this is a thrill for me. This is an area, I'm, I'm an economist by training, financial economist, and have done a little bit of work on stable coins. But I have to be honest, I think it was the blockchain accelerator uh, that, that got started to get me interested in this because they've been operating for several years on campus and they've been, as, as was mentioned, and they've been pulling together a lot of talent. So uh, it's great for me to be here with, uh, with four people that are leading out there, serial entrepreneurs in the arena, all of these things and, and coming from different different parts of, of this, this larger blockchain opportunity set that we're all, that we're all looking at. So um, I'm going to, I think it might be most easiest if we, if we allow, some of you already looked, looked at the bios, but I think if we allow each of the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, and then I'm going to go around a second round and ask each of them to talk about sort of what they're most excited about right now. And there are going to be some interesting overlaps and maybe, maybe some tension uh, in between, which is fun as well. Well, but but let's let's allow each of them to describe what what they are up to. Um, I'll just very quickly, and I'll go in this order. Uh, Alana Aldag Ackerson, CEO of HQ, part of Digital Currency Group, is with us. We'll start with Alana. Mike Lee, co-founder of Rally. Eric Sibbett, partner and head of Financial Technology Industry Group at uh, Melvany and Myers, and Sina Nader, COO of FTX. They're all here with us today. I'll turn it over to Alana just to talk a little bit about what you're up to, uh, her background, uh, serial entrepreneur, and then we'll go through the sequence of, of four just with quick introductions. Over to you, Alana, thanks. Thanks, Rich. It's uh, it's definitely an exciting conversation to be a part of. So I, uh, I recently joined Digital Currency Group, which is one of the most established investors and operators in the crypto space. It's been around for many years and doing some phenomenal work. And we'll be building up a new, a new company within their organization. But I came by way of figure, DCG had invested in the last company that I co-founded, which was in the, the fintech space. And what we set out to do was to build a protocol for originating, financing, securitizing different financial securities. And we decided to concurrently build a consumer lending business because that was a space we knew. And I'm sure we've all seen time and time again, really elegant pieces of technology built and no adoption. 
And we didn't want to just do, if we build it, they will come. We built out a, a consumer lending business uh, focused on um, refinancing home mortgages, on original mortgages, and on a few other products. And then we originated all of those assets on chain. And we used it as a forcing function for Wall Street and more traditional financial institutions and said, if you want access to these assets, you have to purchase uh, purchase our native token hash and transact on chain. And it worked beautifully. And we're now able to take that foothold and start to find more and more interesting applications for provenance in a, across the ecosystem. But that was the way we tackled it. And I think you're seeing a lot of interesting approaches to finding new ways to really get some fascinating commercial applications of what has been worked on in, in both crypto and blockchain across the space. Thanks for that, Alana. She, it's a uh, background in SoFi, a master's and PhD in theology. This is somebody who just brings a lot to, to, to what we're up to here. So, so thank you for that introduction. Um, why don't we move second on my list, Mike Lee, co-founder of Rally. Over to you, Mike. Thanks. Everybody, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm actually a Berkeley alum from quite a while ago, uh, coming out of out of the uh, Eeks, uh, uh school over there. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm Mike Lee, uh, one of the co-founders here at Rally, and Rally, um, it's a it's a social token economic protocol that that basically at its core allows creators and influencers to create their own cryptocurrencies and and ultimately power their own. Uh, economies with their own coin, uh, as well as allow developers to build use cases and applications and interactions and products uh, that can utilize those coins. Um, it's uh, you know it's pretty it's it's a it's it's a pretty fascinating space because we're kind of at the crossroads of of blockchain, which obviously is uh, super is super exciting and interesting, as well as uh, you know the, this this burgeoning area of creator economies. Um, and so it's one of those things where if you go back in time, one of the analogies we like to bring is like, you know, if you go back to like 97, 96, and, you know, you wanted to create your own website, well, you could, you'd have to really understand HTML, you'd have to understand DNS, you'd have to understand hosting, you have to understand a whole bunch of things. And to some degree, you don't even know if you, you know, what would you, do you even want the website? What would you even do with it? Um, and we kind of see that um, uh, happening with, as well with uh, the space we're in. So the social token and NFTs kind of space where if someone right now wants to create their social token, they absolutely can, um, but you'd have to learn, uh, you know, how to program in Solidity. You'd have to understand wallets. You'd have to understand, uh, frankly, maybe the more daunting things, you'd have to understand economics and how, how would you actually run an economy? And so, uh, you know, we think fast forward 10 years from now, uh, it will be quite uh, common for creators and influencers to uh, want to have their own, uh, their own currency, um, and uh, Rally is, is here to help provide a lot of that stuff uh, to some degree in, in a box. We, you know, a lot of the, the, the technical complexities will be taken care of. A lot of the economics uh, will be templated out and designed and, and, and uh, you know, levers can be pulled by the creators, but they don't have to dive into the actual core economics. Um, and so that's what, um, that's what we're doing here at Rally. It was Eeks, Eeks, right? That you that you finished up in. Here. That's right. Yeah. Electrical engineering, computer science. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Over to Eric Sibbett to talk to us a little bit more from the legal perspective. Eric. Great. Thanks, thanks, Rich. So, uh, Eric Sibbett, I, I'm a, a capital markets partner at O'Melveny, uh, and I, I had the fintech group here. And the way I got there is kind of a, over a course of many, many years. Um, you know, traditionally, I'm a securities lawyer focusing on IPOs, representing banks and, and companies through capital raising process, et cetera. But over time, a lot of that was financial services and technology, and a lot of it fintech, and a lot of the kind of the, the gray legal issues, the uncertainty, whenever you take new technology and legacy financial institutions and try to figure out how those things work together. And, you know, kind of over the years, it's gone back to, you know, when I practiced in Tokyo for a while, um, you had, uh, you know, large banks, highly regulated, very low interest loans. Um, consumers couldn't get loans and there were loan sharks on the other side. And then you had this whole, whole industry that mushroomed in the middle, creating credit sc scoring algorithms and doing things like, you know, going to someone's house and looking at how the shoes were arranged in the entryway and, and using that as part of this algorithm for this, this new industry. Um, 
you know, to, to projects like Lending Club, Marketplace Lending, and then about five years ago or so, um, starting more as an academic interest, but just looking at blockchain and, and how, how um, kind of the interesting issues there. And we started getting lots of questions like, what is this from a regulatory perspective? Because the unique thing about block, you know, you know these are, you know, software products, services, um, they can look like a commodity, a security, you know, property. And what is this from a regulatory perspective and how do you navigate this, right? And so from there, I just really mushroomed to working with a lot of major trading platforms and uh, investors in the space, startup projects. And a lot of, I spend my time is uh, given this legacy financial infrastructure, how do you navigate that process and, and think about doing things in a responsible way that allows innovation? Thanks for that. Eric, and so your your background, obviously, in capital markets and a huge set of opportunities opening before you. Is this absorbing most all of your time? This this category? Yeah, I mean, I still do the very traditional, you know, IPO work, et cetera. But this is really where most of my time is spent, and uh, it's fascinating. Got it. Thanks for that, Cena. Over to you, please. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Rich, thanks very much. Uh, so I'm Sina Nader, Chief Operating Officer for FTX US. Uh, focus on our US efforts here. We are a, a regulated exchange. Uh, we also own Blockfolio, which is a place for people to buy and sell crypto. So uh, I kind of look at stuff from the trading side of things. Uh, and I think that we have just an awesome cross panel of folks here looking forward to this discussion. Uh, like Mike, I'm also a Cal alum, go Bears. Uh, and Rich, a quick side note, um, you know, uh, I always say if I were a little bit smarter, I would have majored in economics uh, while I was at Cal. Uh, but I did take one course uh, with Dr. Martha Olney, um, which to this day, I actually credit for sort of setting in motion a bunch of, I guess, processes in my head that ultimately led to me coming into crypto. Um, so um, just delighted to be here. Um, background wise, I guess I think of myself as sort of a hybrid of a sort of Wall Street and crypto person. Um, started off at Morgan Stanley, then went to Credit Suisse, um, and then later co-founded one of the first fund of funds in the crypto space, um, and then uh, joined Robinhood, where I headed crypto, uh, and then came to FTX, and here we are. Wonderful. Well, I think those of you that are listening, and thanks thanks to all of you for being part of this, I mean, you, you see how many different elements of, of the picture we've got on our panel, which is super exciting, and some of the contact points between them. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with Sina, we'll go, go back uh, in, in opposite order, but that, that question of right now, what you're doing right now, there's some pretty sophisticated listeners that we've got on today. Well, what's got you excited right now? Is there something that's been going on in, in your world that, that feels like it's where we should be thinking? Yeah, um, I think what's got me excited is the excitement uh, that is sort of permeating the, the space this time in a little bit more, um, I guess, mature way than the last time we saw a lot of sort of excitement with, you know, the ICOs and, and, and stuff that happened in 2017. And then, you know, price action goes up and people get excited. This time it feels a little bit more mature. Um, and people are, I think, starting to see that this is a real thing. Uh, we're talking about a technology that has legs and that has far-reaching application, far-reaching implications that we really haven't even started to see yet. And then on top of that, you see uh, big corporations putting their money where their mouth is um, and actually you know, taking steps, significant and meaningful steps into this space. I mean, Fidelity, you know, a multi-trillion dollar asset manager has set up Fidelity Digital Assets. It, it's separate digital asset arm. I mean, JP Morgan is writing 70 page reports on Bitcoin. Uh, Morgan Stanley is offering crypto to its high net worth customers. Uh, PayPal, Venmo, I mean, Visa, MasterCard. I mean, some of the oldest banks in the country are coming into the space. Um, insurance companies. I mean, it's really exciting. Uh, and, and it seems this time that it's um, it seems to be the real deal. So that's got me pretty excited. Yeah, cool. I, I love the phrase too. I'm excited about the excitement, but as we as we think about the things that will drive further phase changes in this in this category, and of course, it's, it's an enormous category when we're thinking about blockchain uh, technology more broadly. But even specifically in the trading world, which happens to be a little closer to what what I do as well as as you described, so many of those changes, even things like you know tokenized stocks, and you know it's like we're we're going to be tokenizing an awful lot of things we haven't even started. To, to tokenize yet and trading them in fundamentally different units and in fundamentally different ways. So super exciting there. Over you, over to you, Eric. You 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 hinted at a few things that that are that have got you going. What's what's on the on 
the front burner? Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot. So I'll just focus, focus on one or two. Um, you know, obviously, DeFi is one of the hotter topics these days, which is, you know, you know, from a from a lawyer's perspective, very interesting, right? Because what what we're we're always trying to navigate. You, you think about regulators; they're used to regulating, um, you, you know, s some of the entities that that Cena was talking about, right? Investment banks. You have insurance companies. You have these intermediaries, right? And what DeFi is is, is disintermediating or reintermediating the whole financial way of delivering financial services, whether it's banking, trading, uh, you know, insurance, etc. And that creates really complicated problems, um, both from regulators and from people who are seeking to, to innovate, right? Because when you're used to knowing who's going to be responsible for conducting, you know, you know, KYC, you know, addressing AML concerns or being responsible for determining you're selling something to people that is appropriate for suitability and et cetera. And, um, but you take this, 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 this way that people can interact directly through a software protocol and achieve a lot of these same things, it creates these issues that, that the government is still struggling yeah. with and we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out, right? And um, it's just a fascinating area. Every DeFi project is different and built a little bit differently and raises different concerns. And so I think that's uh, really one of the most interesting things if you can you know, self-insure through, a, through, a, through a, um, you know, a, a community of people across the globe and do that without a traditional insurance company through a you know software protocol, that's a that's a fascinating and very disruptive radical notion. When we've had built this whole structure of gatekeepers that regulate things and regulate the gatekeepers, and now you blow that up, and what do you do with it? Mm. Love it. Well, another great. I mean, the whole insurance market is is a fascinating set of applications when you think about sort of event driven outcomes and and payoffs and. Uh, you know, another thing that I, I love your use. So as, as a, a financial economist, I mean, we, we, we've talked about disintermediation, a pretty clumsy word for a long, long time. But the idea, the historical idea was, you know, you've got two endpoints or counterparties and there's a bunch of layers in between and we're going to take some layers out. But it's sort of like, no, we're re, you used reintermediation, right? The notion is, no, it's like a totally different stack. It's a different set of layers. It's not just taking a couple of layers out. It's like a new stack. And anyways, that's just a fundamentally different economic proposition. And uh, the, the regulatory and compliance issues that you pointed to are, uh, are pretty fundamentally different. Over to you, Mike, how about kind of front burner? What's, what's on your mind? Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff that's, uh, that Sina mentioned is, is exciting to us as well, particularly, you know, we start to see uh, more um, consumer level uh, corporations starting to uh, pay attention to crypto. So. Uh, obviously, the stuff like what Venmo and PayPal um, and Robinhood and Cash App are doing, where it's starting to expose uh, more mainstream users uh, to crypto, I think that's that's fantastic, um, and uh, it's going to lead to more and more uh, understanding and adoption about what crypto is. Because I think for a long time, crypto has always been a little bit like, okay, hey, that's you know, you got to be really sophisticated to understand that, or it's it's really just a store of value in in, in the case of like Bitcoin. But you know, I think. Uh, some of the stuff that like what we're doing here at Rally, where we're starting to think about it more from the application layer uh, and what that can do and how how we can get uh, that understanding. Um, and so along along those lines, that that stuff, I think, is really exciting. Um, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in pairing with that, I think we're starting to see also uh, um, a lot more uh, attention paid to um, how crypto is presented. So th even things like UI and the uh, the design of things is becoming a lot more User friendly, which I think is obviously critical to, to getting some of this mainstream adoption. Um, the last thing I'd say I think is what's also really fascinating is um, you know this emergence of um, of communities, right? So um, communities in the sense of uh, to say, for example, my project Rally, you know, we like to say that we are uh, community owned, basically. You know, it, we are not governed by a singular uh, corporate entity where we can control what's happening with the project. We really hand it off to to members of the community and you know they can vote with their holdings in terms of you know key governance aspects so i think this is a whole new kind of paradigm of how how these projects um you know grow and live and sustain uh you know directly with the community versus how i think a lot of businesses have been run uh, in the past well i love your flagging of of the governance concept which is important through society generally, but especially here when people are thinking about sort of philosophical orientations and, and what, what 
institution categories people want to tether to over the next 20, 50, you know, and longer numbers of years. So that's, uh, that's, that's a topic I think we'll, we'll come back to is sort of uh, who, who owns the means of production, as it were, or at least the, the decision rights that are so fundamental to what we're doing. Um, Alana, over to you. You mentioned kind of we've got, we've got users of funds and, and, and suppliers of funds, and, and you're playing such an important role there. What's, what's on your front burner? Well, I mean, first, just coming back to this idea of the new stack, you know, it's it's new and it's a re-intermediation re in a sense, but it's it's faster, it's cheaper, it's more transparent, and so it's inherently less risky, which is what is really exciting and I think has taken a while for people to, re to really resonate, this idea that it is less risky structurally. Um, but I think we're seeing that recognition now, which is great. But but one area that I'm I'm excited to see, and I think we're just starting to test out the potential of, is is one of the implications of reducing the friction in transactions, and and that is really really powerful. Um, is the fractional participation in the economics of some of these communities. And, and commercial um, sort of enterprises, right? And, and that's why it's, it's fun to be on with Mike because I think Rally in many ways is, is getting to the heart of, of this, but it, it allows for business models now that are much more dynamic because people can share in economics, even if their share is only a fraction of a decimal point, but that fractionalization is infinite in so many ways and the distribution is infinite. So the the applications are really, really cool. And you know, the ability to participate expands and that fundamentally changes the gameplay. One of the one company I like that's a, a good example of this is um, some people may be familiar with Brain Trust. Um, it's it's in the Bay Area and, and their B Trust token, but you know, the way it's structured is the the ownership and governance in the 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 brain trust network that's being built up you know it's it's represented by the b trust token and the token is used in a, as an incentive in multiple ways to reward the community for building the decentralized network for inviting and vetting talent on the community uh, onto the network right amongst each other for referring in new clients and they're there is participation in the economic benefit and in the activity at multiple layers and it's constant and so it creates that really vibrant dynamic network and marketplace and i think we're going to see more and more of that around specific niche communities mm -hmm. and at scale and that is a fundamental transformation of how we engage commercially and i think mm -hmm. that that's that's going to be those are going to be some of those real world use cases that i think are just going to blow people's minds mm -hmm. and are going to be really fun to see unfold Oh, I love those examples. That that fractional participation concept is is so powerful. And you know, as an economist, it, it, when we think about what things happen naturally in an economy, when and and part of the answer to that is, you know, well, well, who can get compensated for doing what we need them to do? And 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 in fact, the way the traditional economy works. There are a lot of things that just aren't going to get compensated in equilibrium, and and so that makes a lot of things infeasible, right? But when when I can create a piece of digital art, when if I if I can take a photograph that becomes iconic and and get paid for that in kind of the infinite future as a part owner, even if it's just a sliver of of, of the of the royalties or or payments that that's that 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 really changes obviously the return to to, to art. And that's just one piece of digital content. We could talk about so many other things that that people can participate in. Anyways, for me as an economist is sort of like the feasible set of economic outcomes uh, gets a lot larger when a lot of different players can actually get paid, right? Um, you know, when people talk about the long tail in art, it's sort of like, yeah, if you're a musician, it's sort of like, if, if, if you don't know one of these kind of gatekeepers, then, then you're not, you're not going to be, you're not going to be in the game. And, and now it's, uh, it's distributed gatekeeping. Anyways, thank you for, for raising that. I think I'd like, I want to get, create a little more flexibility and I want to urge the, the, the listeners to, to pop your questions into the, into the chat. 
and I'll get some of them in here. Um, what I'd like to do, and I, any, you know, any of you can kind of jump in here, but it's sort of the natural next question. And that's, you know, what, what keeps you up at night or what's what sort of a risk factor where it's sort of like, look, this thing kind of needs to go in path B rather than path A for this to be fully enabled. Any Anybody want to jump on that? So I can start off, um, it's maybe a risk sort of to the positive side, but also potentially to the negative side, depending on how you think about it. Um, if you look globally, uh, in terms of how many unique crypto wallets there are, um, how many people are actually using crypto? Um, the best estimate that I've heard recently, I think is somewhere around, you know, 100 million people globally. Um, and we've got what, seven point something billion people. So I think that's like, that means 90, I don't know, six, 97% of people do not yet have crypto. So on the one hand, that's terribly exciting because as an economist, you know, we talk about supply and demand. Well, if the, if demand increases, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens to the equilibrium there. Um, on the other side, why haven't they gotten involved yet? Um, why are 96% or 97% of people not yet in crypto? And I think that comes back to stuff that, you know, everybody on this panel, we've talked about, you know, it, it previously quite a bit, but like, you know, it's usability, it's scalability. Uh, I think Mike touched on this earlier too. It's just like, how do we make it easier for people to come into the space? Um, and really, in my opinion, how do we make it possible so that crypto is almost invisible so that people don't think, oh, I'm doing something in crypto. They just mm -hmm. think I'm doing something. Um, uh, and so how do we get to that sort of future state? Um, that's something that I think about a lot. Thank you for that. Others? I, I mean, I'd say, uh, you know, besides things like, you know, my site getting hacked or something like that, um, uh, also around, uh, you know, I think. Uh, part of one of the reasons I think, you know, we, people do have a little bit of, uh, of a, uh, not necessarily fear, but trepidation about getting into crypto is also some of the uncertainty around uh, government regulations, right? So, you know, you've been hearing in the news where, you know, is Turkey going to outright ban crypto? Is India going to outright ban crypto? You know, what's China up to with its, you know, its, its digital sovereign current, uh, cryptocurrency? So I think some of the government regulations and, and you know, where how, how that plays into it, um, you know, is also... Uh, a barrier, and then I think you know we're 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 only a few countries away from you know some countries taking some drastic actions, which could potentially even put us back into a, a bear market mm -hmm. uh, from the crypto perspective. Um, so I think some of that stuff, um, you know, I'm hoping you know the governments are starting to realize what's uh, what's needed to continue to further innovation in in the space. Um, but I think that is is definitely one of the things that that uh, that I worry about. Yeah. Could I? Could oh, I, Mike, could... I... Oh, go, go along. I was going to say, I agree with that. I see so many companies, so many amazing, amazing projects um, lift the, the foot off the pedal because it's hard to feel as if you really can, can sit very deeply into a new initiative, a new product, um, a new build out. If, if the regulatory environment is so uncertain, right? Because you don't want to do that build, you don't want to go for it and then have it all be for naught. And so I think the regulatory uncertainty in my mind is, is one of the most challenging dynamics. Now, you know, it's to be expected. We're seeing a massive shift in the systems and structures of, you know, sort of our, of the financial e ecosystem. And so watching more and more dialogue, engagement, um, really informed voices in the mix is great. And we just need more and more of that so that there's, um, you know, a better canvas to be building and, and experimenting on. Mm. Well, and, and Eric, yeah, please. Yeah, no, I was just going to add to that. I mean, I, I, I fully agree with all those comments. And, you know, one of the things that, that worries me and that I've seen, um, particularly given the, the uncertainty of the regulatory environment in the U.S., are projects that, that leave the U.S., right? Things that are start here, that built here, and people move overseas, they hire employees overseas, and they build things outside of the U.S. And so some of that innovation that could be happening here is, you know, and, and, it's, and it's good good for some countries, right? It's dis it's, it's distributed. Um, I am a little bit optimistic. I do feel like some of the trends that we've been talking about a bit here, there is this convergence between the wild west of crypto and call it traditional uh, both companies and financial institutions, right? And the more people that have a stake and an interest, a vested interest in the promotion of this ecosystem, the more that's going to help encourage the right kinds of regulations and clarity that's needed for that to continue to prosper. And that's really starting to happen. Of course, we saw the Coinbase listing, yep. um, you know, kind of recently, and um, a, a lot more. You know, we're, we have a lot of inbound inquiries from traditional financial institutions, et cetera. And so, I have some optimism about it, but it's it's definitely a risk. And and what you know, 
you know, trying to operate in, a, in an area of uncertainty is, is, is challenging. You're always trying to channel the regulators when the, the rules aren't clear. Yeah, and, and we have a number of great questions in the chat, which I wanna to get to, but, but just continuing on this topic, because it's so fundamental for all of us. Um, you know, one of the things that we see in industry, pro, young industries is at some point they create a kind of industry association. I mean, not like, oh my gosh, do we, do we need another institution? But, but it's sort of like, how do, how do policymakers stay informed? Right. So when you think about kind of, you know, m mature tech, it's sort of like, look, Congress brings people in and talks to them and there's a constant interaction and big firms are investing a lot of money in in sort of how policy gets made and and making sure that the information is on the table and, and so forth. Um, so there's less apparatus there. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether there's there's sort of a, uh, is there a next stage in the way policy gets shaped? How do we how do we do that better as a society? So I'll, I'll, that just, I'll just jump in there, there first. So, you know, one of the things that people are essentially self-policing, right, where you have industry associations. So one of the one of the projects we're involved called the Crypto Rating Council is looking at um, you know, kind of the fundamental risk that something's a security, right? Taking in case law guidance, you know, the technology and putting it on a continuum, right? And a lot of that is in the absence of more specific and clear regulation. And so that's the industry that's often closest to the technical issues and they can help translate some of that for the policymakers, right? And so I think there's a big role for that across different areas. Um, and there is in fact, you know, a lot of lobbying and stuff that is going on now. And so I think we're gonna see a lot more attention focused in a you know at a legislative um, level uh, and, and rulemaking level, and we've had change at the SEC now, and so I think you know none of this happens quickly enough, but I think we'll start to see some some uh, tailored uh, regulation. Thanks for that, and, and that's very much you know in 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 your space, and I think uh, you know people at the CFTC, but throughout government, I, I even even people like me are, are getting calls from people in government, sort of saying, "Can we bounce some questions off you?" and so forth. That's that's a healthy thing. I think people are sort of saying, "All right." Um, so let me go to some of the questions here. Um, there there are a couple that that are related here. One has to do with. Um, proof of stake and the other one is sort of blockchain more generally is as helping us address societally climate change and so forth. Those are not unrelated questions, but uh, does anybody want to touch on uh, proof of, of stake in particular or other consensus mechanisms and whether um, whether you see sort of great, greater energy efficiencies coming out of this, this category in the fu near future? I realize this is a little farther from the expertise of all four of these panels, but it is a question that uh, that has come up. Yeah, I mean, I can just take a stab at it. Um, look, as with any technology, you know, things are improving over time, uh, and there's people that are working diligently in the space that are acutely aware of this and of these issues and related issues, uh, and thinking about how can we do this better um, in the same way that you know computers. And then you know laptops and then cell phones kind of evolve. Uh, I think you can expect a similar sort of trajectory uh, uh, in the crypto space. And you know there's there's blockchains, for example, like Solana that use far far less you know energy than than many other um, uh, blockchains and so forth. And I think you'll see a lot more of that going forward. Um, but sort of specific technical stuff, maybe some of the other panelists uh, might want to talk about. Yeah, it's. Um... I think it isn't it isn't exactly the right question for this panel. That is a really important question. But I think the point that you just made is is important, Sina. And you know, part of it is we can't even see how much evolution. I mean, if somebody said at at the advent of the internet, you know, which wasn't that long ago, it's sort of like, you know, this stuff isn't going to happen or this stuff isn't working well, and it's like, oh my gosh, have have things evolved? So so people are. Are certainly working very very hard on this and even like the zero knowledge proof stuff right it's sort of like how do you know that this person has a, a know your customer badge or something right if you want to be able to take a payment from this person is this uh is this an aml approved uh, counterparty or whatever i mean they're just there's so many things that are so hard right now that is sort of like no i think we're going to crack that maybe not in a year maybe not in five years but um so, so I, I share your optimism, and I and I think, uh, and you you gave a nice example of of an efficiency enhancement that that's already out there. 
Yeah. And, and, and Rich, just to add to that, I mean, kind of, uh, I think at a meta level, something that I often think about is a quote that I remember from some great thinker. I think it was Aldous, Aldous Huxley, uh, sorry, Aldous Huxley. Huxley, yeah. Uh, uh, but I'm not actually sure if it was him, but somebody said that when two great civilizations go to war, what actually ends up happening is they end up becoming a little bit more similar to each other. And so I think of like the world as there's like the crypto world and then there's the traditional world. Um, and I think that there is a battle going on. I mean, you can think of it as a war, you can think of it as a conversation, whatever it is, but there is an interaction going on between these two, what you can think of as great civilizations. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of things that crypto, quite frankly, can learn from the traditional world. And also the traditional world can learn from crypto. And I think that all of these things, all the regulatory stuff, all the um, user you know, interface stuff, all of these things are sort of different vectors within this sort of conversation. And so I think ultimately you can expect to see you know, crypto learning some things from the traditional world uh, and then hopefully getting to uh, um, a, a sort of nice equilibrium uh, in the longer term. Yeah, and and that bi-directional learning, I think that that really is, and we're already seeing some of that in terms of kind of the democratization of finance and things that Alana and others have contributed so much to. Um, let let me ask a, a question that's kind of at a little bit more personal level. There's some, still some great questions in the chat, but you know, part of what I'd like to ask, I, Eric sort of sort of touched on this already, but um, what were there mentors or other things that sort of got you started in this direction, right? What, what, what were the triggers? I'm just wondering um, whether you had some role models in your life or there were other things that you were doing where it's like this, this was so adjacent you could hardly miss it. Any, any stories on your own professional journey? I can share one maybe to get us started. Um, so when I first started to really look at crypto seriously, um, I started talking to people that I knew, um, people from the Berkeley community, people just in the computer science community, people in the technology community. Uh, and one of the people I was lucky enough to get a meeting with was um, the founding CTO of one of the largest tech companies uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, and we sat down um, for breakfast and um, he, I was just blown away by how deep into the space he had already gone and he'd already formed a thesis. And this is like, I don't know, five, six years ago, maybe seven years ago, um, that to this day it holds correct. So he'd already thought like many, many steps down the road. Anyway, when, when this type of person basically validated the entire um, concept of, you know, what crypto can do for me at such an early stage when I was sort of thinking that it might be interesting, that just sort of like, was the, the 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 sort of final push that I needed to really jump in with um you know with everything I had. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know if I have a, exactly a, a mentor in that sense, but uh, I you know I can very clearly trace back to how you know we got into crypto. Um, and so you know my prior career here, you know I started a, a, a mobile gaming company which we were looking enough to sell, and then after that I got into you know opened up a, a an esports uh, organization, and it was specifically within that esports organization. Where you know I don't know if people on the call you know know much about esports, but uh, particularly in South Korea, you know esport players, if you're really good and you're a pro gamer, you're like an idol. You know you have throngs of people who are running up to you to take pictures, and you know was watching some of these guys and learning about how their economics work when they're streaming on Twitch and how much the platforms take, and understanding where their money comes from, and and, and you know diving really deep into understanding the, the, the this phenomenal fandom that exists around these people. Um, and thinking about that and thinking about my, my prior career at the gaming company where it was all about, you know, economies and virtual items and virtual currencies and then kind of sticking those two things together is like, oh, what if this guy, this guy has clearly has got the following. He's clearly already doing economic things where he's, he's getting tips, he's selling merch, he's doing all this kind of stuff uh, as an individual. And, uh, you know, just the one sidedness of, of his relationship to the platforms he's on. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that, that kind of, you know, made me, made, made, made us really want to, uh, get excited about, you know, getting into this, uh, this, this, uh, this space around, around that. So, you know, I wouldn't say that that programmer is my, my mentor, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, his, his situation was what really kind of galvanized us to start thinking about, um, this, this connection between the uh, crypto and, and fandom. Well, I love it. It's a great example, too. And in some sense, it's sort of like there's an enterprise there and it's an enterprise that that kind of grew into a system. But a small story, if I may, my, my daughter's 18 and applying for college and all the rest of it. And does, she sells stuff on, on a lot of these these uh, online platforms. Right. So I said, well, you're an entrepreneur. You've got a little business. Right. She's going, no, I'm not. I mean, that's just not the way she thinks about it. It's sort of, yeah, you are. You know, you are. 
you have to price it, you have to ship it, you have to, what's the inventory? Oh, and sort of like, yeah, maybe I am. But, you know, this notion of this kind of platform, enabling platform development that you guys are doing now, it's sort of like people that, that have something going on are going to be less dependent on, uh, on, on using existing or others' resources in order to sort of create an enterprise. It's, it's, um, it's kind of profoundly enabling, obviously. Uh, Alana, over to you. Well, I just, uh, before I answer your question, Rich, I, I love that Mike touched on the gaming piece because one question that's come in from the audience is how is crypto going to influence uh, the gaming industry in the future? And and one thing that, that you're starting to see now are, are not just um, the, the gaming, the experience of the game changing, but the, the ability of some of these new approaches to actually generate jobs um, at, a, at an interesting level. So for example, Decentraland is, is this decentralized virtual world. Um, and, and there's a casino that exists in Decentraland. And that casino is now offering jobs to players to act as hosts within the casino. And you get paid at the end of each month for doing a shift. And so I think you're starting to see kind of these really fun meta plays within the gaming space where you're able to generate jobs, you're able to engage virtually in new and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. um, there are new crypto applications. It's just, it's really exciting. But coming back to, you know, your question, Rich, um, you know, I think it's less about a mentor in crypto or blockchain and more of an orientation that I think I've had and I see in in sort of peers in the space of, you know, and, and this is maybe where the, the theological inquiry comes in a little bit, but it's, you know, the pursuit of, of newer and better technology, both the technics and the processes, the way of doing things, is really an expression of hope for a better future um, mm -hmm. and a better way of being human. And I think, you know, we... It's, it's, you know, I'm someone who believes that is such a part of who we are as living beings. And we as humans really have this desire to create and to co-create. And so I, you know, I mean, crypto, blockchain, they're tools, right? They're, yep. they're tools for transforming the ways that we live and the ways that we engage in commerce. And it's a very powerful thing. Um, they are newer tools and we're just kind of testing out the, the potential and the power and the boundaries as you have to test with all new tech. Um, but, you know, the, the, the quote that I think we're all familiar with around, you know, if, if, if Ford had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. You know, I think what we're starting to see is, is a real change in the infrastructure. Yeah. And um, in in kind of the philosophical approach to a lot of things that we've taken for granted, and that's really powerful. And it it takes people who are excited about the ambiguity and are excited to test out new tools to really lead the charge. But I think that it's something that is a broad desire, and and the momentum that I think we've all been speaking to on this panel you know, really speaks to that desire for mm -hmm. what's next and for the next best and the next best and the next best. Well put, well put. You know, I think that's one of the things that a lot of us bump up against too. It's sort of like I was in a, a board meeting and somebody was talking about this category that they called crypto. And it's sort of like, uh, this. it was like, there's nothing of value there. It's sort of like, you know, or, or people on the, on the upside, right? It's like, man, you are just always pitching this stuff. Aren't you seeing that there's some pretty crazy stuff going on? It's like, yeah, that, that's this wonderful distribution with two tails in it. But, but the, the ultimate potential to build a better world here is really, really large. And the idea that you would only look at one tail of this marvelous distribution and, and make inferences based on that is, is, is crazy in itself. Um, but, but the, the sort of steerage of it, right? That this, that it gets propelled because people get involved in it and help propel it in various directions. That's uh, that's a wonderful message. Thank you for that. Um, there's something I want to come back to because I think everybody, you know, there are a lot of good questions in here, but I, I'll just, you, one of the quotes that I think went to all of us. Yeah. If anyone can make cryptocurrency, then how will you put a value to it? Right. And, and there's some, some other related, you know, questions here. If it, if it's mostly speculation, um, 
then then how do we think about that and non fungible fungible tokens and you know we, we've we've so so this is a very big and hard question but it but I I think we kind of you know if if somebody said tell me about the tangible value here of this of this token or these tokens you don't have to speak to anyone give it give us a some concrete handles for understanding value that some people might not appreciate. Uh, sure, I'll take that one on because that's a question we talk about a lot here at Rally, right? Because we're allowing creators to create their own cryptocurrencies, and these are explicitly not securities. These are explicitly utility tokens, uh, and they're not meant for investment. Uh, obviously, you know, people come in with different motivations and buy these tokens. But yeah, how are these currencies valued? I think it's very much, you know, how much utility and value, uh, you know, um, you know, can you get with these currencies? Like, so I think. With, with us, you know, we very much focus with our creators on, you know, how can your currency be used? And they can be used in multiple different ways, right? So obviously a lot of fans, uh, what, what does a creator have to offer, right? They have, you know, uh, uh, the benefits they offer, are, you know, recognition or access or, uh, you know, even physical goods to some degree. So, you know, what we really encourage our, our creators to focus on is, okay, hey, you have uh, fans who hold your coins, you have fans who can transact your coins, uh, but the more utility, whether that is, and utility in this case could just be holding, right? Like, okay, hey, all my uh, holders, you get access to this, or my top holders, you get access to this channel in my in my Discord where, you know, I'll be more present. Or, you know, you have to hold a certain amount of coin to become eligible to, you know, enter this drawing where I'm giving away, you know, this, or, or, or to the point where, you know, these signed CDs are only available for purchase with my coin. So I think the more that the coin um, has utility, I think that's how we're um, we're proposing the coin is valued. There will always be uh, some portion of the audience who I think are coming in as as financial actors with financial motivations. Um, but you know, for 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 rally specifically, we're approaching it very much as you know, how do these these creator coins that that um, our creators create? How are they how are they utilized, and how does the value? Uh, come from that and and you really start from a value function right it's sort of like it, that's kind of the design question right when we design a course it's like what are the learning objectives you're designing a, a token it's like what 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 value is this token going to to exchange and uh, i mean that, that's it's such a nice starting point and it's also i just to flag this i think it's obvious to most people but somebody could say yeah but that you know that's valueless to me it's like but that's not the question the question is, is it valueless to everybody i mean there are people that value that thing right and and that gives this coin a value i mean there are a lot of things out there that i would attribute zero value to that have a, a high value it's just like i i don't get any value from that but that doesn't mean the equilibrium price should be zero and or for example take privacy right somebody could say god i, I don't I don't mind the privacy level of using the U.S. dollar. Well, okay, then you use the U.S. dollar, but there are other there are other alternatives out there that have a very different privacy level. And if you value privacy highly, you, you're going to pay something for it. So, or or even time, right? In the in the often in the West, people say time is money. But you know, when I, when I was living and working in China, you know, a lot of people there view time as free. You know, they they can spend hours and hours grinding away at a game to earn some free stuff because, in their view, time is is free. And so it it's uh, even time is something. Any other quick quick reflections on value? Two two quick uh, observations here. Um, one is that in the absence of cash flows, um, you know, value is probably uh, uh, based on the narrative. Um, so that that's the first thing. And then the second thing I would say is that there's sort of a temporal element here of of sort of short term and long term. Um, so in the short term, generally markets can be inefficient. Um, but generally, over the longer term, markets tend to be more efficient. So I think that there's there's a natural sort of dynamic that's going to work itself out over time. On on the on the mar market efficiency piece, you know, when we were starting to build a provenance, w there was a keen awareness that the blockchain itself was not the moat, right? It wasn't the tech. There was nothing particularly magical about building a blockchain. It was about developing the network. It was about developing an audience. So the value of hash um, was linked to the vibrancy of the network, of the ecosystem, right? And so we invested very heavily into the ecosystem, into engaging people, into bringing people to the table. And so, and you'll see that with a lot of tokens. You can easily, you know, sort of trade away to a new token if there isn't the activity, if there isn't the velocity, if there aren't the real world 
use applications, right? If there are challenges structurally with actually putting tokens to work in the ways that they're meant to be put to work. And so a lot of that has to do with the ecosystem. So I would say, you know, I, and the, the next piece is, you know, in the absence of cash flows, you know, I, I'd say look to the health um, and the extensiveness of the network and ecosystem and what direction it's moving in. Thanks for that. Very helpful. Now, we want to get some feedback from this, this audience, especially um, on how we as educators can do better in this area. So I want to turn it over to, to Iklok and Jocelyn just to help shift the, the conversation a little bit here. Sorry, yeah, I was on mute. But yeah, I don't actually want to end the conversation exactly, but just a, a little bit of a pivot as we head towards the, the ending part of the session. First of all, I just wanted to add or say that this has been like a tremendous conversation already. I, there's a number of points that have come out um, and I'll list a few of them about, I'm gonna say the concept of mature excitement this time. I think that came through pretty strongly. The opportunity of decentralized finance uh, Rich, your comment on it's more than disintermediation. I think that that's a resonant comment. The reducing of friction in the economy, uh, the idea of fractional participation and ownership. Um, I think there's a really good point about you're only at three or 4% of the market so far and what's it gonna take to get to the rest of it, but that's a huge opportunity. Being part of regulation versus um, just being regulated by it. I think that was great. I think there's also a bunch of mindset comments that are sprinkled through this whole thing. So that content I think was fantastic, like, like to just try to digest all of that at one time. But as Rich says, one of the things that uh, we'd like to do is as a university, um, you know, we have faculty, we have students, we have our programs. What, what does this group think that the university collectively can be doing to either further it or have making more opportunities for our students to participate, to you know, help create. Uh, just what are the intersection points with, with academics? We would just love that input. Um, and, and I'll turn it back to Rich to help moderate that, the answers to that. Um, and then you know, that kind of makes it full circle for us. Sure, I, I can go unless Rich, you want to. Yeah, it's say, a no, tough please. question. There's no yeah. doubt. There, go, Mike. go ahead. Go. Uh, I mean, I, I was looking at uh, you know what what Berkeley offers, and I think it's it's a great start, right? And um, the thing that struck me really was, you know, I think you know how I view it, and I think how a lot of the panelists here view it is, you know, crypto is basically a whole new layer that lays on top of you know almost every could lay on top of almost every aspect of our of our lives, you know, current and future. And I think it's easy to, to get stuck thinking to, oh, crypto and blockchain, that's really just in the realm of engineering and code or in the realm of business and finance. But actually, I think it's, it, it's a lot more and it can be a lot more, right? So you start talking about, you know, certainly there's the cryptographic stuff and the, the technical stuff and the financial stuff that we've seen with DeFi lately. But there's also, you know, whole new areas around privacy and trust and regulations and, and social behavior and uh, even geopolitical implications to some of this stuff right so you know i think you know for for a university like berkeley how do we start getting you know, other academic departments in the university the law school the the political science department you know even sociology like you know how, how do people start viewing each other when uh you know i can see how much uh, crypto tokens you have or you know what you hey you may be holding my token so i do i value you as a fan are you my super fan because you hold more of my tokens or are you a super fan because of something else i think there's a lot of aspects there that crypto can get start getting um, looked at from from a, a number of different academic departments, not just uh, business and engineering. So, yeah, that's gonna... something actually, I'll just say that Karen Bauer, who's my counterpart at the Haas School of Business, um, that does a lot of work there for their blockchain initiative, brought up this idea of like a blockchain digital asset innovation hub mm -hmm. that allowed like all these different stakeholders at these different colleges across the campus to collaborate together with industry. So 
you know, like you're saying, Mike, you know, it goes beyond just the engineering and the business school, um, but all these different entities on campus. And I know, Rich, that's an emphasis of yours is how do we get more of the social sciences involved? So I think some sort of innovation hub around this technology definitely makes sense given the implications of it. So, yeah, but Eric, I think you were gonna say something. Yeah, no, yeah, no I'd love to jump in. So just also as a Cal alum, I'd love to see Berkeley reimagining, playing a role in reimagining what a regulatory environment should look like here. But I think there's there's a lot of interesting things. That you, and this, this, is, this is law, this is technology. A lot of things with blockchain, I mean, it creates the transparency that hasn't existed in a lot of other environments. And there's so many different applications. So I think there's, there's a unique, whether it's through research, actual real world impact and looking at data and engaging with regulators. I think there's a really interesting leadership role that, that people can play in, in framing that debate and, 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 and steering it in a way that, that, again, addresses legitimate policy considerations, but also fosters innovation. And the only other thing I'd add for people building projects, right? If you can build a project which creates commercial market excitement and doesn't raise the concern of regulators and can kind of, kind of, kind of work between those two things, then that, there's tremendous opportunity there. So I've got a couple, <laughs> couple yeah. of thoughts. I, I agree, that, uh, awesome. Suggestion feedback. So, um, one of my math teachers uh, once said, halfway jokingly, um, the best way to hear is to listen. Uh, and so, um, I would say, like, just asking corporations and asking industry, like, what do you guys want? Um, and, you know, there's just so much talent at Berkeley that comes to Berkeley from all parts of the globe. Um, and I would love to see something like, you know, maybe there's a, a, a some sort of matching engine where you've got students in Berkeley and then you've got corporations and, and you know, industry uh, outside that would, is looking for talent, right? And you could do maybe like a competition, like, you know, any given company could come to Berkeley and say, hey, we're trying to solve X problem right and put it out as a competition to the students and maybe it's for a prize maybe it's for an internship maybe it's for something uh something else but um there's just so much talent at berkeley that that comes from all parts of the globe and then there's so many industry members globally that could benefit from berkeley talent so there's there's basically a way to um to bridge that gap i think in, in the form of maybe a competitive environment mm. yeah very good anything come to mind for you alana you know, I, I, I think part of it is um, creating opportunities to just see more of these real world use cases because I think they spark the ideas. Um, and it can be hard to identify where the new ones are sprouting up. Uh, and, and, you know, I think there are, they're always the headliners that, that we have access to and the success stories. Um, but I think finding new ways to, maybe co-experiment and, and, and really examine some of the things being tested out in the early stage is helpful. Um, so finding a, a systematic way to do that, I think would be additive. That's a really yeah. good, yeah, right. really great Start feedback. And yeah, we do an yeah, we do an innovation engineering course that ICLAC developed that does bring in challenges from industry and we have the students kind of um, ideate on those and try and come up with new solutions and new use cases. So um, kudos to ICLEC for kind of developing a framework where we do that with a multidisciplinary set of students. So um, we'll keep building in that direction, definitely. And his book of the same title, Innovation Engineering. Yes. Um, I, now I don't, I know we're running pretty close on time. I'll let you manage the time. I'm happy to keep going, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you're putting me on the spot to stop. Yeah. What's a super engaging conversation? I, you know, I'm going to say we're probably over a bit. Yeah. Um, if you if you have you know like a comment or two maybe, or you have a burning question, we could probably do it. But I think uh, right after that would probably be a good time for us to leave the audience hungry and and move on. <laughs> And come back for more. Well, I I think you know I think we should should let people go. We have gone a little over. I loved what what you said, Iklak, when you were pulling out a lot of those themes. And I I'm not even going to try and replicate it. Uh, uh, but but um, you know when we think about any one of those themes, uh, you, you mentioned I'm going to say ten of them, eight to ten of them. But but you could you could focus on any one of those and and 
and write a book on it, right? I mean, it's just, these are just really big meta themes. And that's part of why this area is so exciting. So, you know, Sina had the comment early on, excited about the excitement. I think, you know, for somebody who's even, look, I'm kind of a wonky academic, right? And But intellectually, this is as interesting as it gets. And practically, it's as interesting as it gets. And when you have both of those things going on at the same time, man, there's a lot of fun to be had. So I think we're all... We're all enjoying uh, a very interesting and, and rapidly developing area. So uh, I, I, let's just do it even more together than, than we have in the past. Okay, so thank you. I'll take that as kind of the wrapping comment. So thank you, Rich. Definitely thank you to all the panelists. As I said, those were fantastic contributions of understanding and putting all of the pieces together. This last part where you were advising us more as the university, uh, I think there's some really great directions there too. Uh, I love the idea of reimagining the regulatory environment. I think there's a lot in terms of the mixing of the industry and, and academics. Uh, I, your point on understanding trust and social aspects and the social nature, they're, they're not lost. Um, all of that, um, really wanna appreciate it. Uh, I want to appreciate everyone's time for um, like bringing all this uh, knowledge and information together. And I'll just kind of close it. I know, Justin, if you have a final word and you can nod your head if you do, but, um, but if you don't, I just want to say again, thank you. Um, I, I just love today's session. Um, there's a lot of change going on. That means a lot of opportunity, and a lot of things for us to understand. So thank you. Yeah, just very beneficial. Thank you all for your time. Really great to meet all of you and have you participate. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Stay Thanks, close. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.